good to be here. My goodness, all these people. How awesome. It's a, a fabulous event. Thanks to all of the organisers. It's great to be here and see so many people here and to um, be part of these really important conversations. So I'm Fern Hames. I'm the director of the Arthur Isler Institute for Environmental Research, which is part of DECA. We have our own little bit of nature in Heidelberg. Can't hear me. Can you hear me up the back now? Just somebody wave a bit closer. No. <laughs> um, hopefully people can hear now. Can somebody wave? Yes, got a few thumbs up. There you go, Kelly. And I'm particularly delighted to be here today to introduce uh, Kirsten Bauer to you. Now, Kirsten is a respected design leader with 20 years expertise in public realm and infrastructure strategy and design. I sort of wondered what that was. So I looked her up <laughs> and oh, I went, ah, she's that Kirsten Bauer. I remember this. She has led significant award-winning projects across Australia and internationally. And the work that I've seen of hers is incredibly thoughtful, insightful and inspiring. And today, Kirsten is going to speak on urban myth number six. Honestly, Kirsten. People won't like it. They won't like it, will they? Nah. Please join me in welcoming Kirsten. Uh, thank you. I'm a bit overawed by the um, significant audience here, so thank you very much for coming. And, and thank you. It's pretty hard to follow the speakers we've just had. So I will introduce my presentation it's a little different for those who have seen me speak before. This is quite off the side, if you will, so bear with me. It's a bit of an experiment, but we all have to experiment and, as we said, transform. So that's part of that. But I suppose so many people have spoken today around um, purpose and meaning and agency. And this is, in a sense, saying I agree with all of that, but I am a practical person. I'm at the edge of practice what can I do about these issues? I believe in them, but how do I enact them in my daily practice? And what are the typical barriers and problems and issues that we come across in our practice life? And this has been a landscape architect and many of you in the other sort of urban environmental groups will probably have similar issues and there'll be a lot of, yeah, yeah, I've heard that one before. So laugh along with me as well. So, you know, it does have got some humour in there. And I always introduce myself a bit of, I'm a bit of an optimistic pessimist. So this has got a bit of optimism and a bit of pessimism. So talking about planting landscapes and um, public landscapes. So this is very much focusing on the public environment, not the private garden, not botanic garden, but you know, the, the main green infrastructure that we've been talking about and the typical parks and gardens of, of our environment. And in a way of trying to understand We'll call, we'll call it likability, or why don't people like native plants or indigenous plants, or is that a myth, which in reality it is a myth. We all love plants. Well, most of us do. Um, you know, so I'm just taking on the fact of, yes, we do love plants, but then how do we convince our clients and the public to embrace that within their public landscapes? That is the next step, you know, many of us struggle with. You know, we always turn up at community consultations and you ask questions, do you like plants? Everyone's hand goes up and then you go, would you like that street tree in front of your house? And everyone's hand goes down. So that's what we're talking about. It's the spectrum between the ideal and the ambition and the practice on the ground and what can we do in between. So I did this really, I'm not an academic or a scientist, so none of my graphs are perfect at all. You can throw mad at them. I've got a bit of statistics and, and they're completely incorrect. But I did think about, as a landscape architect, when we're talking about planting indigenous plants, like there has always been an incredible trend or a, a thematic across Australia of interest in indigenous plants in the design world. You know, and so this is my little bubble, you know, set, and, and we've done pretty well. Like there's my upward trajectory arrow, as in, yes, we are going to peak, I call it peak likability. We might plateau at some point. But, you know, we have started, I've just gone back to the 1960s because that's my tradition. I come from, you know, a bush garden tradition as the origins of, of looking at native plants in the landscape architectural design world. You know, that was the big boom time, the, you know, if we had a big peak there. And then we moved to bush regeneration, you know, then we moved into the habitat world, wussard, healing plants, green roofs, 
urban forestry, wildlife meadows, and now we end up caring for country. So we've done this incredible journey of what is the Australian identity? Oh shit, we actually have a landscape and ecology. What does it look like? To, oh yeah, we are interested in climate. And yes, by the way, we should look to our wisest people on our planet to help us out here. So, you know, we've come a long way, but it, there is incredible trends there. And then I did the other stupid thing was asking um, my landscape architecture friends to fill out a survey because I was interested to know, I can't, I've got my anecdotal evidence, but I wanted to find out from others, what do they hit in practice as this issue of likability? So we've got 30, so someone will tell me if that's statistically good out of 100. I think that's pretty good, actually. So here you go. You can, you can take this away later and come up where you will of it. But they're really just some takeouts. So I asked them a question, right each of the following for how importantly they typically are to clients and public and planting design. I was interested in the difference between what clients say and what you know the public say, because as landscape architects, we're always caught in the middle. We get a we get a brief and then the public wants something different or vice versa. So there's this thing. Um, I suppose what's really interesting is um, you know, the clients were really into um, biodiversity and climate resilience and Low maintenance, funny enough, the clients are much more interested in low maintenance than the public are interested in low maintenance. So, you know, no brainers there. Um, there's a whole range in there. But I did also was interested in, are we getting briefs that say explicitly Indigenous or explicitly Native or Native and Indigenous? And it was quite remarkable. We weren't getting briefs that actually put that forward. You know, it was sort of like a known thing. It was more the landscape architect and I suppose the team who brings it forth. And it was less actually in the briefs themselves which is an interesting point. So that's only 30 out of 100. So, you know, there might be more out there. So lots of other issues in there um, as well. And then I sort of asked them, you know, what, what are the high, you know, the, the traditions or the attitudes that we typically run across? Are they myths or not myths? Well, this is what people were saying. Well, I did ask them, I prompt them and then they scored it. So, but messy still came up. It's incredible. Despite all this evolution we've undertaken, we still get the conversation around messy um, which is interesting and not aesthetically pleasing and it dropped limbs, you know, and this is what I suppose I, I tackle every day with communities and the clients, you know what I mean? And so if some great scientists out there can help us out on this, you know, issue, that'd be fantastic. Um, but, you know, that's some of the sort of things that have come up, you know, and, and, you know, don't look good after a few years always seems to rate highly. And this comes back to our understanding of our lack of understanding of Australian vegetation and how it looks and how it evolves and how it needs maintenance and it needs regimes, you know. We still yet as a society haven't quite understood that evolution and embraced it within our public landscapes. Like, we're, it's OK if it's over there. We just don't want the beautiful brown next door to us, you know, and that is still out there. Um, probably no, no things there. So there's some takeouts. And then I sort of sort of went, well, what are the barriers to likability or maybe usability? Because we've already kind of agreed we all like them, but will we use them is another question. Um, so big, big no ticket items. I mean, many items here you would have come across before. So this is a bit of a summary for, for most people here. You know, guess what? Nursery industry, not enough diversity. We start off with a master list of 300 plants, yet we look at the EVCs, the biodiversity, the climate change resilience studies, the tree change studies, you name it, every list. And then you get to what's actually available in little nurseries and it's this tiny list. So we have these grand ambitions and then we have to procure 3,000 plants in two months and we end up with, you know, Osbreed. So, you know, there is a big, I'm being dramatic here, but this is what we have to contend with every day, you know, and this is still out there. Contractors, oh, we love that one. You know, it finally gets out of the contractor and they finally need to go and, you know, buy their plants and then they finally, after six months, go, oh, by the way, the nurseries don't have it anymore, you know. So, so there's that six months of consultation around biodiversity and talking to a local ecologist and the local community, in a way, it just all goes to shit sometimes, to be perfectly frank, because it ends up with a contractor who is not a landscape contractor, he's basically a civil contractor trying to plant plants on behalf of the contract and, anyway... They're getting better. I know there's be some contractors in the room. There's no doubt the world's getting better, but this is the sort of the humour side. Um, and basic lack of information, and we all love the stereotype. You know, um, as someone said here, these are great quotes from, the, from these landscape architects. Tend to think of the big five, eucalypts, acacia, banksias, grevillea and calistamins, um, you know, and the assumption that the main character of Australian plants are open grassland or similar scrub typologies. And again, I embrace the thing this morning, let's embrace the scrub. Let's embrace um, the brown. Other things, oh, shade. This is a big one, and we're talking about urban ecologies, green roof systems. This has become really big, I would say, in the last five years, is shade. 
And for those, I can see some nods. So believe it or not, this is a big, big issue. The more, more cities we build, the more shade we produce, the more microclimates we create and the more diversity and more different types of planting systems we require in our city. And this is something we're seriously having to confront. Um, and so, and, and in a sense, what's happening now is, uh, uh, you know, but this is, you know, a University of Melbourne building that, you know, states all their buildings are covered with Indigenous plants. Cough, cough. Of course not, because... This site only gets two hours of sunlight a day. And yes, there are a lot of natives that go in shade, but not that many natives that go in shade. So the issue is performance, you know. And again, it's caught into our clients going, well, do you want a great green landscape or do you want an indi a pure Indigenous landscape? And we're constantly having to have those conversations about what do they really mean? I haven't worked it out yet. That's why I've come to learn from you guys. Um, and shade, well, I am part of the Green Line team, so I am learning a lot here today. And you know, we are on the north bank and it faces south. We will have lots of shade on the green line. So I've been thinking about this as if this is going to be something. We have to put plants under viaducts, under um, vi bridge systems, similar to infrastructure systems. Shade and dry shade, you know, everyone loves dry shade, but that's a big issue. How do you get biodiversity, good looking plants that achieve ecological outcomes in dry shade in the middle of the city? I'm sure Nick Williams and some other scientists can help us out on that one, but it's it's bigger than we think. You know what I mean? This is what our urban systems is becoming like, and we have to start addressing it proactively. Um, limited Australian aesthetic tradition, and this is still true. We've had some great explorations, Cranbourne Botanic Gardens, incredible garden design, but it hasn't fundamentally made its way into public landscape, I would say. We're still going back to traditional aesthetic design in the Australian landscape. Um, the ordinary Australian landscape. So it's going, it's coming, no doubt. You know, and this is what I call the classic problem. Everyone loves the Lemon Centred or Citradora Avenue. Who, everyone, everyone loves this one, you know, the Edna Walling, beautiful avenue. And every client wants that, and you can't, but they want an Indigenous landscape or they want flowering gums that will bring birds and diversity. And you're going, well, maybe the Lemon Centred won't quite do that. And then you try to sell the, you know, the, the iron barks and the scribblies and the blah, blah, blah. And everyone starts getting upset because, oh, but it doesn't look, doesn't look civic enough. It doesn't, you know, it hasn't has these aesthetic qualities. And, but there are some great examples. We're just not very good at talking about what I call the, you know, the slightly messy example. So this is a fantastic one um, done up in Coburg, like over 10 years ago. It was one of the first times I actually explored a different type of eucalypt beyond what I call the smooth bunk, smooth bark bunch. You know what I mean? We've got to move beyond some of these stereotypes. So other stereotypes, low maintenance, I think we've talked about that a lot enough. Low maintenance is not maintenance, <laughs> you know. Um, all landscapes need attention. I think we've pretty much hit that one on the nail today, so let's not um, drag that one out. Language and labels, lack of understanding between ideas, terms, objectives and performance. I'll give you some examples of this. Um, I, was, I was talking to the guys before, like, what, can someone tell me the difference between ecosystems, urban ecology, biodiversity, climate resilient plants and indigenous plants? in a short space of time that people actually understand. Like, because we find ourselves, you know, in environments, community meetings and councils, and someone throws the word biodiversity, then someone throws the word ecology. And, you know, we haven't really worked out a way of really articulating what that means in an urban environment with really clear examples. Um, you know, so that's something I think, um, particularly as a landscape architecture group, we have to um, get a lot better at. Um, what else we got? So this is a classic one, um, is, you know, We've got to a point now, which is fantastic. You know, we've gone from the tree, we are now interested in ground flora. This is amazing. We've, we've transformed our lives. We're actually interested in bushes and small creep, you know, creepy crawly things on the ground. This is fantastic. But what are they? Like we hear about native meadows, wildflower gardens, flower meadows, local grasslands, and I'm still confused. I spend, I spend so much time with clients going, but what do you actually mean? Do you want a biodiversity meadow or do you want a flowering meadow or a grassland that has flowers in it and it all comes back to that that there is a mismatch I think between the you know call it, the visual aesthetics that we are getting particularly from Europe in terms of the wildflower meadow and then on the other end the sort of um, the indigenous grassland zone and, and there is these incredible hybrids happening between these two major typologies but I can see from my side this is a growing issue and we've got to be careful because we might be proposing all these lovely 
meadows, and I'm not here talking about the grassy, um, the woody meadows, because that's not a meadow, as even they say, the low ground stuff, we keep promoting this. And I feel like we might construct our own myths soon, where everyone will be going, but where are all these beautiful indigenous native flower meadows in our cities? Can you please show us some? Because they, are, you know, they're incredibly different in terms of maintenance regimes and such. So that's an issue. I'll be interested to hear what people think about this. Um, so what do we do? Some tactics, some running out of space. We all know this, communicate ecological benefits. Believe it or not, some people still don't do this, but, you know, just pull out any local government policy and there'll be a shitload in there about why we should use Indigenous plants. It's not that hard, but it's amazing how some people still don't do it. So it is there and there is a lot in there that we can use because this is what the community is after. There's so many times I've been meeting where the client is pushing one thing and the community stand up going, but no, we want more biodiversity. We actually want more out of this than the clients are potentially saying. Uh, tricks of the trade, communication, great signage. You know, it's always good to have a great signage. You can never have too many signs. But it's incredible how much lack of information there is around Indigenous landscapes in our parkland environments. And I'm not talking about reams and reams of information. I'm just saying a sensibility of being able to access information easily. Low maintenance. Um, you know, and this is something really interesting that we're going to start talking more about low maintenance with resilience and biodiversity. And I think a few people have already spoken about that. This is going to be one of the next evolutions. So that'll be really interesting to see how um, that goes. I like that. The most pushback has always been from council maintenance departments. Sorry if you're here today. You, you, in a sense, we should be designing with you just as we should be caring for country. If you really take that philosophy on, we need to spend more time working with the maintenance um, crews, the horticultural crews, like they are the they are the you know the main people on the ground doing this work, and there is a big gap between the policies, the designers, the bureaucrats, the design you know, and and them, and that's something we have to change as well. You know, if it can't be hedged or whipper snipped every six months, what is it worth as a plant? That is unfortunately a common thing, and it's not their fault. It's the fact that we basically have chopped their entire budgets. Let's be honest, you know, we, we treat them as a service authority, we reduce their budgets, and then we wonder why all they do is mow the lawns. Um, the cute factor, we've talked about that, with charismatic vegetation, I think this morning, so great, we're all talking about link to fauna. You know, if you put images of um, koalas and birds in there, it's amazing, because people think, I think we're getting much more sophisticated now. When we're talking about plants, we are talking about, as we said, habitat, we're talking about life. And I'm better now in practice of understanding when we show people images of design, we need to show them life. It's not this static thing. And we ourselves have been replicating this myth of being no life in public landscapes because we never really represent the life within public landscapes. So, and the design narrative, this is a, a trick which everyone uses. Just keep repeating, the, keep repeating it. So many times we just get swayed by other people and we just have to keep sending the message every single time until it hurts. So keep going with that one. Tricks of the trade. This is the one I worked on at Bunurong um, Memorial Cemetery. And the client actually said, we want to be different. We want to embrace native indigenous plants for a cemetery is pretty remarkable. We're all you know, the, the rose and the rose bush is a memory, an internal memory within um, life and death. But here is a cemetery that said, no, let's embrace a different cultural relationship with our plants. And it's actually been successful. These things are successful. People kind of go, terra, terra. You know, we can't move away from the exotics. But this cemetery is thriving. Um, of course, there's a pun in there, but you, you'll get it later. Uh, but, you know, but they're into it. You know, they're supportive of it and the community have embraced it as well. So there are great examples out there of excellence in this area. Um, aesthetic education, you know, this whole thing about messy, you know, and really it is, it's, it's, it's in ground in our mentality of seeing beauty in messiness, you know, and, and it still comes down to it, we all know it. You talk about the trees and someone's always there in the audience, sorry audience, yeah, but I have this tree, it always puts leaves or bird shit on my car, so therefore I don't want that tree or I don't want that tree. Or I love trees, I just don't want that tree on top of my car. You know what I mean? And the reality is, like caring for country, you have to care for your car. If that means you have to soap your car once every now and then, then so be it, you know? This is what we have to change, is this sort of sensibility of no mess. Messy is beautiful. Um, all right, quick one. I think too many people are caught up in a certain aesthetic 
We can go from formal to completely regenerative planning, incredibly diversity. I'm just saying out there, I'm tired of the clumps of trees in municipal parks that have been scattered inconsequently, badly designed, just thrown in there. You know, we need more intention within our public landscape design. I'm not talking about spending lots of money on expensive landscape architects. I'm talking about just thoughtful planting design and tree planting design in our spaces. Um, this is a formal native garden. For, you know, natives look great in formal relationships. It can be done. Tricks of the trade, clump, not scatter. That's what I'm saying. You know, especially when we're talking about shade and issues like this, there are, you know, funny enough, not many parks actually have clumps of trees. Go out and have a look and have a look at how, you know, and you won't get a lot of the clumping. I'm sure there's biodiversity in there somewhere. Someone will tell me that. Um, it's a subtle grid. You know, I suppose these are little trends of how to get from a European mindset to an Australian aesthetic mindset, you know, the grid does work at times because the eucalypts never produce a grid, they always go off grid. So it's perfect. Um, you know, the grid will never die. There is reasons for it. That's for make sure people get through all the trees. Sinuous organic, we've all seen these ones. And I'm just putting a plug here, let's make the bush gardens, bush gardens cool again. I think there is, you know, the, the messy, the beauty and the messy aesthetic of this drawing is incredible. Um, what else do you do? Show lots of precedence. I think we know that, but as, as funny enough, every person, every person who spoke today, someone put their hand up and go, where can I see that? Can you tell me a precedent? And it was remarkable how lack of precedence we could actually cite or articulate where to experience this. So that is something which is pretty, you know, as we say, feeling something is much better than showing an image of something. So we do need these good built examples and bring them to people's attention. And my time's running out. Emotional connection, I think we've talked about that. There's nothing like an emotional connection. Just get a CEO into green things and you end up with the green line. It does happen, <laughs> it's just, you know, but emotional connection, as we know, is the only way to a political person's very cool heart, unfortunately, or warm heart, depending on what your politician is. But it does work. You just got to find the way in there. Um, experience the thing, I think we talked about that, you know, and there are some incredible things that people have been doing with native and indigenous plants in our urban environments, which are different and which are innovative and are changing the aesthetics. And I could go on forever about some of those, but they do exist. And don't forget the sneak attacks, just put them in, just don't tell anyone. <laughs> Seriously, why do we keep telling there's indigenous plants? They're just plants, they're just plants, you know, they're just plants. I've always loved that one. Show the research. You guys do incredible research. We need to use it better. Absolutely, that's our problem. Um, procurement. Yep, let's, that's a whole other conference there, as I was talking about before, the lack of the ability to actually get the ambition in the ground. Um, and to end up on Aboriginal culture, they're the way forward. And, you know, that's who we need to speak to. Um, and there's some examples there, are the green line, some things coming up in the future. Ah, oh, sustainability credits, don't forget, you know, this is what we've been talking about. The policies are out there to use Indigenous plants and biodiversity in all this credit rating system. We've just got to use it for good, you know, and, and unfortunately it means a lot of, a lot of thinking, um, a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of tick boxing, but it is useful. You use what you can to get what you need. Um, and presentation texts, sprinkle colour, fauna and life in your images. It does work. But as I would say, just not too much. So we create a myth of what it actually looks like. Thank you. <laughs> so good. I love the messiness. I love the messy square metre stuff. I love the bit of subversion there. Thank you so much, Kirsten. We are going to go straight into having our panel. So I'm really delighted to introduce to you three amazing women joining Kirsten as well today. One of them I know really well, Lily Van Eden works with us at the Arthur Ryler Institute. Uh, Dr Lily Van Eden, she works on environmental behaviour change and she's incredibly awesome. Welcome Lily. We've also got Emma Cutting, who's the founder of the Heart Gardening Project. And some of you might know her Melbourne Pollination Corridor Handbook, which is incredible and gorgeous. Thank you so much for that work. And we have Bree Trevina, who is from 
Well, actually, Brie, I've got your title as senior manager, but Michael Sean Fletcher told me that I should rename you to the senior carer, okay? <laughs> so you've got a new PD now, I'm senior nice. carer at the Melbourne Arts Precinct Corporation. What we know of is MAPCO, that incredible project I hope we get to hear a bit about today. And of course, we've got Kirsten still with us. So perhaps we'll start with Lily just because I know you're Lily. <laughs> Would you like to reflect on what we just heard from Kirsten and um, how your work sort of intersects with this? Thanks. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, I guess I wanted to make a couple of points in reflection on what you had to say, but also some of the um, diverse conversations we've had today. And I, I just um, I hope this doesn't sound like I'm starting on a, on a, on a negative thought, but just... Um, you know, you were talking about how sometimes people don't want to deal with birds pooing on the cars and things like that. And I just um, wanted to make the suggestion that, yeah, it sounds great. Let's have more biodiversity in, in cities. That means people have more interactions with nature. That shapes people's relationships with nature. And it sounds all positive. But I think it's important to remember that people's interactions with nature are not always necessarily positive for everybody. And there can be negative consequences of bringing in more biodiversity, depending on the kind of interactions they have. And whether it's birds poo pooing on your car or or you know I was living in Sydney before I moved here and there were bandicoots that look cute but they carry ticks and people get diseases from those like it can shape the relationships people have with that nature but also the social conflict surrounding that so does it shape that person's perception of local government or nature conservation as a whole and those are not not trivial um, conversations to have I think um, but one thing I, I wanted to remark on that I loved how you started was talking about um, the trends in um, how we think about nature native plants in garden design and that made me or, or urban design I should say and that made me reflect upon something I've been thinking about a lot lately in that um, whether we think about it as trends in urban design garden design or even just what nature conservation fundamentally is it's ultimately about thinking about what kind of nature do we want around us what do we perceive nature to be what sort of interactions do we want to have with nature what are our priorities for conserving the natural world and that does change over time um, what we're all in here talking about what we want nature conservation to be there may be some unity in what we all think about but if we went and asked people on Swanson Street what do you think nature conservation is we'd get very different perspectives um, and you know I, I come from a western science background and so that's largely shaped my thinking about nature conservation but even just through that mindset not thinking about um, indigenous ways of knowing country or multicultural approaches to thinking about nature conservation, how we think about Western conservation now is very different to how we thought about it 50, 100, two years ago, 200 years ago since colonisation. I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but just thinking about, you know, 200 years ago we had acclimatisation societies trying to bring in non-native species and we had the marsupials destruction bill that declared marsupials as pests. We've gone along a journey in that time that has largely been shaped by our cultural perspectives and, and the cultural value we ascribe to different species. So I say that to, as a reminder that um, ultimately how we think about and practice nature conservation is a value laden and human endeavour and we have agency in shaping what it's going to be in the future and that's what part of what we're all here to talk about today is what do we want conservation to be in the future. Such big questions, Lily. <laughs> uh, Kirsten, did you want to respond or we get a view from one of the others? Uh. Big, big. <laughs> Let, let's jump to Emma. <laughs> While you think about that, we're going to jump to Emma. Emma, what about your reflection on this from your expertise? Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Fantastic. I come from a very different angle, it feels like, anyway. I live in the world of street gardening, gardening on mostly public land with the community, but creating gardens within many constraints designed for biodiversity. Our main focus is the Melbourne Pollinator Corridor, which when created will be eight kilometres, ecology centred, um, Australian first, community driven wildlife corridor for our native pollinating insects. That'll be connecting to um, Royal Botanic Gardens to Westgate Park. In the last few years, I've spoken to thousands of people about 
locally and around Australia about street gardening and biodiversity. And have also led two community campaigns against local council around gardens for biodiversity in public realm. Community won them both. I have learnt many things. <laughs> this, this myth, people won't like nature in urban areas. I wonder if it's to avoid uh, certain challenges, admitting certain challenges. First, how to reconnect society to nature after many generations of designing nature out of the world around us? How do we support society, support the community to care for nature when they haven't actually been taught how to do it? In the words of Sir David Attenborough, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. Biodiversity is something people get is important, but they often find it hard to connect to emotionally. Society has created this separation from nature, and now it's time to uncreate separation through connection. I suppose uh, we need to get people not only experiencing nature in the city, but how do we get them to care for it? And this requires support, not just planting gardens, but support, encouragement and empowerment of the community to connect to nature. And we have to do this as quickly as possible. And that's the space to sit in. That's what the Heart Gardening Project is all about. And what we're doing is trying to create this care and this connection through all sorts of different angles to cater to all the different people in the community. Second, I've found that when presented with all the benefits that nature can bring, the community actually do want it. But not necessarily because of biodiversity, but because of the many benefits that it can bring socially, economically, environmentally. And I just want to say that, you know, the, the work that I've done, I've needed um, a lot of science and there's a lot of people in this room that have created uh, work that has backed up my, my work, has been able to make me do my work and I thank you all very much. I suppose then the last question is, I end with a question, is how can authorities create the immense change in their own systems to keep up with a community that's quickly connecting to nature? Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And I loved that every word that we heard from you was very rich with care and passion. Um, I think you You've just said that beautifully and I can feel it coming back at you from the room as well. <laughs> so, Bree, what about Mapco's view on this? That's a hard... Oh, am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. It's a hard one to follow from, from both of you. Um, you, you mentioned care and, and these ideas of kind of care and repair have come up again and again and it, and it really is something that we think about a lot. So, for... Those of you who don't know what MAPCO is or where the Melbourne Arts Precinct is, it is essentially the bit of, bit of land that is south of Burrung, just across from Federation Square. Um, Melbourne Arts Precinct encompasses Federation Square and that space where the, the spire is. Uh, there is going to be an extraordinary new contemporary gallery there. The art centre is being reimagined. And the piece of this project that I am working most closely on is 18,000 square metres. That's a lot of space. Um, that is going to be a new garden. So it is connective tissue, absolutely, that is going to be creating new links between these buildings and between different parts of the city and helping to do a lot of kind of suture and repair. But it's also a garden in and of itself. And when we've been thinking about this in terms of will people like it, I mean, it's, it's a really important question, right? That this is a very big project. It's a huge state investment. And a lot of what we think about when we think about who needs to like this, yes, it absolutely is. There are many different communities and visitors from Melbourne, but it's also 
sort of other creatures, right? We've been talking about this quite a lot with you. I'm around biodiversity. So who actually needs to kind of embrace and love this garden? Yes, it is our kind of constituents that are human, but it's also a whole range of other fauna that is endemic and native to this area. So when we've been thinking about what this means in terms of planting, we've been working with a range of horticulturalists, we've been working with um, university, we've been working with um, laundry around what this actually looks like to create a space that is an active generative sharing with nature in a really different way to what we might be used to be doing in the city, particularly in, in Melbourne. I mean, Melbourne's always been kind of the garden city. I remember that on my mum's number plate when I was little, garden state. But how do you actually reimagine what that looks like in contemporary times and moving forward? So for us, when we're thinking about who likes it, we're also thinking about, well, what does that actually mean for, you know, the, the blue banded bee? What does that mean for kids who are going to be in this city? But also, what does it mean for those people who are going to come after us, right? This is a generational project. It, it will be there in 50 years. It will be there in 100 years. So when we start to think about what do people in the future need, what are they going to like, it is going to be good air quality. It is going to be that kind of connection to nature. It is going to be lower urban heat island. It is going to be things that kind of help in a system's way to address all of these kind of enormous challenges we have going. So I think there's a lot to balance up in this idea of kind of who likes it and how, how, how broadly we think about that kind of who in that. Yeah, look, a couple of you have touched on things that are coming up in the questions on the app as well. And I'm not going to read them verbatim, but I'm going to combine the ideas a bit. It's But they're kind of around well, how do we help people like what we would want them to like? <laughs> that, that sounds a bit marketing speak. Another, another option is um, maybe we just don't ask them. <laughs> don't ask <laughs> Well, you, well do you, they have to like something to do that? Can, can people support and appreciate and provide approval for something but not necessarily like it? You could actually say sometimes people's aesthetic subjectivity is sometimes too significant in how some decisions are made. Well, yes. <laughs> so, so one of the questions, Kirsten, is people don't always know what they want until it comes to life. As practi practitioners, how much can we ask forgiveness rather than permission to drive that aesthetic change? So that's pretty much yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, I, but I also think it's a, a social contract and that's what I'm saying we have to be careful that, yes, we might experiment and, and because we have to. We, we can't just, you know, sorry, it's a, it's a classic story. Like I remember in the 80s, everyone always talk about, you know, all the houses that have been built in the suburbs all have bull nose verandas. And someone very quietly rightly said, well, that's all that's been offered by the real estate people, so that's what people want. So we have to provide different examples to broaden people's understanding and, and a sort of aesthetic choices um, I suppose but also it's a social contract so you have to deliver on that and and that's where I think the point um, many people were making and maybe I didn't make so well is that that the maintenance and the regime and the caring for them is as important as the idea itself because if if the care once it's in is not there then they will degrade and then we lose that social contract because we're not fulfilling that ambition yeah, I'm partly hearing from you that there's. this is also a question of leadership. Mm. Okay, uh, let me check. Um, oh, you mentioned bullnose verandas. Let's go to heritage. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Asha Wedding has asked a question just a few seconds ago, which is on this kind of. How do you work within the restraints of heritage Victoria, which often require trees to be replaced with identical exotic species, or trees from a quite limited planting list, willow, poplar, etc. How do you manage that? Anyone, you can start, Kirsten. Uh, it's contextual. There's the easy answer. It all depends on where you are and the her you know the classic heritage significance. Where you are, what's what's the issues? It's complex. There's the um, easy answer. Um, but sometimes you just do because, you know, that's clearly a, a strong value. I think it comes back to what is the purpose of the entire landscape and is, you know, again, if the purpose of the landscape is to do something different and the retention of that heritage tree does not fulfil the purpose of the bigger purpose, then I think there is a discussion for change in that regard. Yeah, yeah like most things, it all comes back to purpose, right? Yeah, um, I think to back that up from I mean, Melbourne Arts Precinct, a lot of heritage around there, a lot of things that are on the heritage listing. Um, 
I think we've, we've been really pleasantly surprised at, at how open um, that conversation is in terms of what does future heritage look like and how do you differently reinterpret heritage while still honouring it in a, in a contemporary way. And to your point, I think it, it is contextual and it's about what is that broader vision and story that you're able to kind of put forward in a compelling way around people having greater access to this kind of heritage by being drawn to it or being able to see it in a different way that is a bit more reflective of who we are today and where we want to go. Emma, did you want to add to that? I could see you doing that thing. <laughs> there are many uh, tricky spots in the Melbourne Pollinator Corridor zone, so between the two large green uh, sites. And a lot of people ask, you know, what about this site here? This, this, it's so paved or it's really tricky here. And I'm like, absolutely. There are many tricky sites, and this is where I suppose heritage could come into this, is that it's actually not about focusing on those, from my point of view. It's actually doing everything that is possible within constraints and rolling that out. And what I've seen is that by creating as much change as possible, even if it's changing uh, an exotic lawn to a native lawn, that is immense change for biodiversity and for the community. It has massive flow on effects. It flows on and it creates groundswell within the community. It shows the community what can be done with these spaces. That's pushback on local government. And local government have told me many times, that's what they need to get a move on with their change as well. It works both ways, of course, but it's actually trying to, f just doing as much that is possible in order to create that change that, you know, then there's more open conversations down the track. Yeah, thank you. That, that's actually Lily. <laughs> I'm starting to think now about change and how we generate different changes in society and those opportunities for behaviour change. You know, one thing changes and you use that to achieve other forms of change. Is your brain starting to go in that direction? If not, can I encourage it to? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to go in the direction that you're wanting me to, Fern, but I, but I was sort of reflecting on, on the past, um, the last question that you asked prior to this one about heritage and, and about showing leadership and, um, you know, sort of the original question being how do you get people to um, like things that they don't want to like or something like that. And, of course, there are ethical questions about forcing things on people that they don't want and might feed into those social conflicts I was talking about before, but I really like that you mentioned leadership. Um, and I think for many people it's just... Um, we, you know, we can create new norms about what urban landscapes can look like, what is possible, and um, and it takes the, those bold steps to do things, in, of course, in partnership with communities to ensure that they're going to be appreciated and, and valued. Um, but uh, you know, we we can't. This is this is your field, but uh, but I perceive that many of our landscape designs in urban places have been just continued to be influenced by European garden styles, and so we're we're talking mostly about. Um, urban um you know public spaces but for for you know uh, lenore talked this morning about the value of people's backyards and for those tiny patches of biodiversity space we want to generate new social norms about what people can do in their own private spaces as well and just with my behavior change hat on um, and thinking about the individual and their own private gardens, which we all know, especially as we're talking about with COVID, having that green space accessible to you is so important in shaping people's relationships with nature. Um, you know, you were talking about how hard it is for someone who knows what they're doing and is seeking to, to do these things to source the plants that they want. For your everyday person who wants to plant something in their garden, it's a real barrier that, you know, with your behaviour change hat on, you've got to make it easy for people. If I personally want to buy Indigenous plants for my garden, I can't just go down to Bunnings. I've got to go to La Trobe and then, you know, it's, it, it's, it is hard for people. And I think we can create these new social norms, but we also think about, need to think about the, beha the, ba the, beha the, the barriers to people adopting these sorts of things more broadly. Absolutely. We have to make things easy. And there is one last question. Quick answer, thanks. Kirsten, specifically for you, do you think we're missing the mark by installing these types of Indigenous landscapes, but not necessarily educating those who ultimately need to maintain them, leading to poor presentation? So that, that connects quite neatly with this idea of make it easy for people, make it easy for this to have success, because we must. I, I think there's also a line in there, was it, and we have to educate people 
What was that? Educate people. Yeah, we're not necessarily them. educating those who need to maintain them. So we're getting bad outcomes, poor outcomes. Yeah, but I think that's because we're not supporting the people who do maintain them. I think it's, you know, we know, um, you know, everything's been outsourced, you know, um, uh, the, the sort of the, the significant career of the horticulturalists in public landscapes is getting less, you know, every, I think the University of Melbourne pretty much, you know, sacked most of its horticultural department. So, you know, it, they're the people who actually are the incredible people who produce the longevity and, and produce the care that, that we all love. And, and I think we need to give that more um, agency in a way, if that's education, support, policy, whatever, more agency in, in the way we think about our public landscapes. Here, here. Thank you so much to Kirsten, for Lily, Bree and Emma.